I'm Michael Schroeder, the executive director of the Quittapahilla Creek Garbage Museum, gracing the north bank of Quitty Creek right down the road here in Anvil, Pennsylvania. The Garbage Museum features more than 1,500 plastic artifacts plucked from this small river in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Our goal is 10,000, and sad to say, we are closing that gap just about every day. Now, make no mistake, what you see here, this is the cream of the plastic garbage crop. As chief curator, I can tell you that 99% of Quiddy Creek garbage is unsuitable for exhibition. You got your torn and dirty chip bags, your candy wrappers, your bits of styrofoam, your mashed up soda bottles, and your cigarette butts. This 1% of premium grade A Creek garbage was scrubbed clean by our Cracker Jack team of volunteers and strung up on fishing line affixed to a structure of wood and stone along the creek. Now, as you can see, the Garbage Museum is totally ridiculous because it's meant to illuminate something infinitely more ridiculous. And that is the systematic contamination of our waterways with what I call rogue garbage, mostly plastic, that escapes the conventional waste stream and from there ends up in our waterways, into the oceans, and around the planet. So I want to use this rogue garbage to fit you with a new set of glasses. I want to invoke what the writer Donovan Hone in his book Moby Duck calls the archaeology of the ordinary, to help you see garbage all around you, the street trash you pass by a thousand times a day. My goal here is to provoke you into a new way of seeing and a new way of being in your relationship to rogue garbage. My hope is that you walk out of here and you never look at a street or a parking lot in the same way again. And you never behave toward rogue garbage in the same way again, especially where you live and work. What I see in this super abundance of Rogue Creek garbage is a form of endemic structural violence against nature. Ducklings gobbling up styrofoam beads, rotting bat carcasses ensnared in fishing lines, plastic trash woven throughout the sticks and leaves and mud of the creek's debris piles. It's abusive and disrespectful and destructive and wrong. Now, maybe it's because I'm from Minnesota originally and I grew up surrounded by lakes and rivers and snow and ice, but I believe that there's something sacred and magical about water, especially flowing water. And then on river canoe trips, and the dawning realization that a river is a living thing, a breathing, pulsating organism or, or meta-organism with a mind and a will and quirks of personality all its own. I don't think most people really understand what a river is. So, when I moved to this little town, I was naturally drawn to this lovely little stream. And I was quickly blown away by the mass quantities of garbage in the creek, along the banks, thick in the surrounding woods. And I wonder, where does it all come from? I mean, are people pulling up to the bridges at night and dumping their garbage in? And then every rainstorm will bring a whole new crop. Well, it didn't take long to figure out. The creek's rogue garbage originates mainly in city streets and parking lots tossed there by people walking and driving by, and it sits there for a day, a week, a couple weeks. And then a big rainstorm comes on, whoosh, into the creek it goes. I'm a historian, so I tend to see things in the larger flows of time and space. And so for me, a big light bulb went on when Stephen Colbert, who I depend on for many of my most brilliant insights, <laughs> had as his guest on his show Captain Charles Moore, the discoverer of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Now, I'd known about beach trash for years, but I never really made the connection between the local abundance of creek garbage and its planetary scope. So, after my Colbert bump on the noggin, it didn't take long to find all kinds of authoritative resources about the world's five great oceanic garbage patches, massive whorls of floating garbage on scales the size of Texas, made up of billions of pounds of plastic, and to find a huge literature on plastics, and the ecological damage they cause. In these plastic artifacts, in this archaeology of the ordinary, 
we can see a bigger story about planetary processes taking place right under our noses. We can see the petroleum economy, with the vast majority of plastics made from petrochemicals used to create molecules that have never existed in the 4.6 billion years of Earth's history, and that organisms can't eat. Oil became the engine of modernity only about 120 years ago, the blink of an eye in historical terms. We mine and burn and chemically transform these vast stores of captured sunlight and dump the waste products into the atmosphere, in the hydrosphere a tiny sliver of which ends up as rogue garbage in all the creeks of the, in, and oceans of the world. In these plastic artifacts, we can see anthropogenic global climate change. To my mind, the number one threat confronting the human species and one we're all but ignoring. In these plastic artifacts, we can see the whole issue of sustainability, which has become something of a buzzword. Everybody talks about sustainability, and it is a crucially important concept. But it's even more critical to remember that this whole discussion about sustainability is premised on the reality that human beings today engage in myriad practices that are at core unsustainable. In these plastic artifacts, we can see the throwaway society, mass consumer capitalism, the explosion of plastic production after World War II, especially plastic packaging, with millions of items produced to be discarded an instant after they're consumed. We can see transnational corporations, global commodity chains, the mass media, international division of labor, endless such connections to the globalized world of late industrial capitalism. On the biggest scale, in these plastic artifacts, we can see what the science writer Elizabeth Colbert calls the sixth extinction. Colbert shows that the history of life on Earth has seen five episodes of mass extinction. The most recent 65 million years ago, when a giant asteroid came smashing into the planet, kicked up a huge cloud of dust, and wiped out the dinosaurs, leaving behind in rock strata around the world a thin stratum of the element iridium, the signature mark of the, of the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary. And now there's an emerging scientific consensus that human beings are in the midst of creating the sixth mass extinction in the history of life on Earth. In these plastic artifacts, we can see the raw materials of a new geologic stratum associated with that sixth extinction. A layer of plastics and toxins being diffused around the planet via thousands of quitty creeks. I imagine 100 million years from now, future paleontologists digging around in the rock faces and unearthing the signature mark of the sixth extinction, a thin geologic stratum encircling the planet, not of iridium, but of plastics and toxins. So here I'd like to take Michel Foucault's notion of the capillary dispersion of power and apply it to our waterways to envision the capillary distribution of garbage throughout the world's ecosystems. Capillary because it comes from everywhere in our urban areas and it ends up everywhere in our waterways and oceans. It's very grim. So, now that I've totally bummed you out with the scale and the scope of the problem, we get to the uplifting part of my talk. Solutions. And here I have to credit Senora Dina Hernandez of Managua, with whose family I lived during my first visit to Nicaragua. Because every morning, Doña Dina would go out and sweep the packed dirt in front of her little home. And all the women in the barrio would do the same thing, sweeping the packed dirt in front of their little homes. And at first I thought to myself, well, you know, that's pretty foolish, sweeping the dirt. But after a while, I began to see the wisdom of the morning sweeping, taking a minute, once a day, to create a clean public space. So here's a challenge to everyone listening. After this talk, go into Lancaster or any city in the world and walk around the block. Pick up every piece of trash you see. Lay your artifacts out on a table. Now imagine that magnified a trillion times for every city block on the planet. That's what's flushing into our waterways every day. So every piece of rogue plastic garbage you ever see laying in the street, it's poised to embark on a decades-long waterborne journey. This is a capillary problem that demands a capillary solution, a radical shift in consciousness that translates into the equivalent of a morning sweeping. Now suspend your disbelief for just a moment and imagine a world where every property owner and every renter along every city street 
took one minute each day to sweep the street in front of where they live and work. A minute a day to sweep just a little stretch of street. If everybody in this watershed magically signed on, the amount of garbage in Quitty Creek would drop by, I'd reckon, 90%. Now, the Garbage Museum has sponsored dozens of cleanups, but the scale of the problem is just too immense. We can't begin to clean up a fraction, even in this little creek. Cleanups mean you've already lost the battle. It's sort of like trying to bail out a sinking ship with a teacup. Organizers of the Ocean Conservancy's International Coastal Cleanup say the same thing. Their cleanups, like the garbage museums, are meant mainly to teach people about the problem as the first step toward a solution. That solution can only begin at the source, a minute at a day, for everybody with a little stretch of street to sweep. And if disability prevents, the neighbors pitch in. People acting as stewards of the land they dwell on. Practicing an urban land ethic, a la Aldo Leopold. Now I can hear the critics, it's just a neoliberal solution to privatize. Why don't local governments sweep the streets more often or install filters on the storm drains to, to clean out after rainstorms? Those are actually great ideas. But the reality is, and you know this, the reality is that local and state governments are stretched to the limit. And any solution that involves more tax dollars is bound to go absolutely nowhere. The solution I'm proposing is the exact opposite of neoliberalism. I would call it radical democratization. The extension of the public sphere to the public in the most expansive sense. As a community of people with common interests and common goals. To protect the commons that we all share. The only way to begin to clean up the world's waterways and oceans is by stopping the flows of rogue garbage at their origins in our city streets and parking lots. Cleaning up the world's oceans doesn't mean fleets of giant garbage gobbling machines, but a collective urban land ethic. And the question we should be asking is how do we nurture that shared urban land ethic. Teaching children about Road Creek garbage seems like a pretty good place to start. Without a capillary transformation in consciousness and behavior, all this rogue garbage is going to keep flowing down all the Quitty Creeks of the world, and I'll keep plucking plastic artifacts out of this small, lovely, injured river and trying to teach local school kids on field trips to this ridiculous garbage museum what all these dangling plastic artifacts mean in the bigger scheme. Muchas gracias por escuchar.